afternoon, and welcome to the OC Forum's The Future Of program series. My name is Kate Klimo, and I have the privilege to serve as the new president of OC Forum. During our 30th anniversary year, our plan was to invite leaders and visionaries to share their insights into the future. Then COVID changed the future overnight. Without hesitation, the OC Forum offered our first virtual program on Orange County's response to the coronavirus that reached thousands of viewers who were hungry for information. From then on, the OC Forum board worked tirelessly in serving up virtual programs focusing on the future of the economy, mental health, race relations, transportation, education, esports, affirmative action, philanthropy, and even Orange County itself. Perhaps more than ever, we are reminded of the importance of OC Forum's mission to host civil conversations and propose solutions around complex issues that affect us all. Today, we will introduce you to several visionaries who are shaping the future for people in the county and worldwide. As a nonprofit that has historically relied on contributions from in-person events to help fund its mission, the OC Forum has seen people and institutions in this county step up and offer their support through sponsorship. I would also argue that our amazing and diverse board of directors are among the most engaged on the planet. Now we would simply not be able to carry forth the mission of OC Forum without your contributions. Thank you. To all of our viewers, supporters, and sponsors. <laughs> While we face one hurdle, roadblock, and pile of lemons after another, we have not forgotten to celebrate each other. We hope you enjoy today's program as we continue to celebrate the 30th anniversary of your OC Forum. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the conversation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the OC Forum. This session is the future of philanthropy and the arts presented by UCI and UCI Health. My name is Taryn Palumbo. I am the Executive Director of Orange County Grantmakers, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. I am so thrilled to be joined today with an all-star panel of uh, experts who are going to share their perspectives in two different sessions on the value of the arts, how the arts are doing in terms of today in light of COVID, and how our collective experience is continuing to shape the arts. Um, what the value in the future looks like in terms of how we experience it and how we engage and interact with arts, the value of it, not just economically, but culturally and its uh, impact on our everyday lives. And most importantly, how we as a community can continue to support the arts as this industry struggles to regain its footing in light of COVID, both from philanthropic sources, government funding, private dollars and grants. So. We are going to be having an amazing discussion. As I said, it'll be in two sessions. The first one is gonna be focused on this conversation of the value and where we are now and the impact of what's happening in our community in Orange County. And the second session is gonna be looking at funding, how dollars have come in to support the arts and what it looks like in terms of continued need and uh, how philanthropy can support. Before we begin our discussion, though, I am so thrilled to share that we have a performance brought to you by The Wooden Floor. So please enjoy this video before we get started.
Again, that performance was brought to you by The Wooden Floor. For more information about their upcoming performances and mission, please be sure to visit their website featured in the comments below. And now I'm excited to launch our first panel discussion for the day uh, with three amazing speakers, John Forsythe, President of the Pacific Symphony, Kristen Campbell, Vice President of the OC Theater Guild, and Casey Ritz, President of the Seekersome Center for the Arts. Welcome. Uh, if you'd like to each take a moment to introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your organization, John, I will go with you first. First of all, <clears throat> thank you so much for having all of us. Uh, it's a great privilege to uh, share this forum. Um, Pacific Symphony is incredibly the largest symphonic institution founded in the last uh, half century in America and only recently entered the top tier of orchestras as defined by the League of American Orchestras. So it's uh, a remarkable credit to the ambitions of Orange County that such an achievement was possible. Uh, we're a very proud artistic partner of the Segerstrom Center and became resident company there in 1986, just eight years after our founding. Uh, we have 80 musicians who are among the finest uh, in the US and our music director has been uh, in his post for 32 years. So he is the longest tenured music director of a major American orchestra. And he's one of a very small handful of Americans in that role with American orchestras. So I think his continuity of leadership has been a key reason for our growth and impact. Uh, so in addition to about 100 performances at the Rene and Henry Sagerstrom Concert Hall on the Sagerstrom campus, uh, we are uh, offering a very extensive array of uh, education and community engagement programming, both in schools and with community partners as well. And it's something I think, you know, has been a real distinguishing characteristic of the orchestra. So thanks again for having me. Absolutely. Welcome, John. And Kristen. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I'm representing OC Theater Guild today. I serve as the vice president. Uh, uh, we're a newer organization and we support, nurture and promote uh, theater and the live performing arts industries in the greater Orange County area. Um, we have hosted uh, networking events, regional auditions um, and roundtables. Uh, and we've also uh, launched our new awards program, which we hope will spotlight theater in Orange County, uh, which took a little pause in COVID, but we're back up and running again. Um, so we're very excited and we hope to have our first award ceremony uh, in the up upcoming months, which is great. Um, currently we have 17 organizational members uh, that are from all over the Orange County area. And we have 51 individual members, which range from designers to actors, playwrights, choreographers, we, we have them all. Um, and that's what we support right now. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. And Casey. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, as you said, my name is Casey Ritz and I'm the president of the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts. Uh, it's probably important to note that I am just around celebrating my second year anniversary and I bring that up because I started only about three months before the pandemic, which might be important to note as we get into that part of the discussion. But uh, we're one of the largest performing arts centers in the United States uh, in, the, in the spirit of the LA Music Center, Lincoln Center, uh, Kimmel Center. Um, we have multiple multiple venues and present or produce a wide range of live performing arts ranging from uh, Broadway tours, international dance, uh, series in cabaret, chamber music. Uh, we, uh, as John mentioned, we have three resident companies uh, proud to uh, work with the Pacific Symphony in addition to the Philharmonic Society of Orange County and the Pacific Chorale. Uh, we also have the uh, forthcoming Orange County Museum of Art uh, being built on our campus coming very soon. Close Neighbors with South Coast Repertory Theater and a wonderful partnership with American Ballet Theater who are our, um, our is the official dance company of the Sagerstrom Center. I should also note in addition to uh, our live performing arts programs, we're a proud uh, provider of arts education ranging from uh, arts teach programs in, that are embedded in the curriculum of Orange County Schools. Uh, we bus in kids to see uh, student matinees. We serve about 300,000 students a year. In addition to a school called Studio D, which was formerly referred to as 
the School of Music and Dance for Children with Disabilities, and we also host the American Ballet Theater Gillespie uh, Ballet School. So we have a wide range of, of programs serving as many members of the Orange County community as we can possibly reach. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, the three of you, thank you for joining the conversation today. It is a conversation about the future of, but I think we can't talk about the future without reflecting and acknowledging where we are and obviously what COVID has been like for the arts over the last year. So we know that obviously arts were one of the first industries to be majorly impacted when the shutdown occurred. So I'd love to hear from each of you briefly sort of what the last year was like. I'm sure there's a collective experience there and where you are now in terms of programming that you're doing, opportunities that are arising, things that you're pivoting and shifting to, to keep the arts moving. Um, why don't we start with you first, Casey? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question and a tough one, but I mean, you know, it was brutal. I mean, it was completely brutal. I mean, you you know, I have worked my entire career in the nonprofit performing arts and barely a week went by without me uh, having the opportunity to sit in a dark theater. And we went 17, 18 months without that, that really happening. So it turned the entire world upside down. It was, and there were many, many curveballs along the way. I'm sure we all had the same experience where we thought, I mean, if this started in March of 2020, oh, we'll be back by the summer. Oh, we'll be back by the beginning of 2021. And uh, between variants and surges, uh, it just kept going and going and going. We had several challenges. I think, as you kind of noted earlier, that we were one of the first to be shut down, but we were also one of the first, uh, last rather, to be allowed to come back. Uh, based in large part on, on union issues and state and federal guidelines that I think really didn't know how to deal with what we do and how our operations work. We were very blessed in that we have an outdoor venue. And I think we all know that, uh, you know, outdoor venues were uh, much safer. So uh, it was a, the arduous plaza was something we by and large programmed free uh, performances for the community. And what we did was we tried to put everything out there that we could book and that we would normally do on our indoor stages, ranging from classes to movies to arts and crafts events, uh, performances, uh, comedy, cabaret, big bands, whatever we could do and do safely. I think our goal was to, uh, even if it was challenging financially, was to fulfill our mission in the best way that we could. So we certainly did a lot of virtual programming. We provided all of the classes that I mentioned earlier virtually. And that was there was a great kind of silver lining to that in that we uh, were able to broaden the reach of, of those programs in a way we hadn't before. We reached more students and particularly students outside of Orange County, which I think was very exciting and something that I hope that we continue to take advantage of and learn from. Um, but we wanted to fulfill our mission and remain relevant uh, because we knew we were going to be the last to come back. So we were very, I think, mindful. We are, I think we were always optimistic that people would long for the live experience and long for the opportunity to gather again. But we knew that other businesses, other kinds of activities were going to be able to come back sooner and we didn't want to be forgotten in the mix. And so we peppered in and, and gradually came back as, as best we could. There wasn't, as I thought when we first shut down, this big day where we all just rose from the ashes and had this huge celebration. It was fits and starts and a little here and a little there. Uh, but it was, it was good to see how the community supported us, how the staff hung together and kept by and large uh, a good uh, sense of humor about things and a can-do attitude. I mean, I always said that if you think about it too hard, the way it decimated our industry, you wanted to just curl up in a ball and rock yourself in the corner crying. But, you know, we didn't have that option. We had to stay optimistic and had to look forward. And I think I'm very proud of what we were able to do and my colleagues here on this call were able to do uh, to get back. And, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of challenges I think the Delta variant was the curveball that we weren't ready for um, and made things a little bit more challenging, but I think by and large we're back and it feels great. Good to hear. Thank you, Casey. John, what was your 
experience as well. Well, Casey did a great job, I think, summarizing a lot of the feelings we had. Um, you know, in our particular case, the Pacific Symphony was coming off of this sort of period of euphoria. We had made our debut at Carnegie Hall. We went to China. We had a national broadcast. It's kind of this amazing period of, of it, you know, international recognition. The orchestra was just flying high. And then we entered Carl's 30th anniversary season and our biggest projects were scheduled for the final quarter, which for us is between March and June. So, you know, the last thing we did, uh, I think it was like March 8th was play for ABT. They had a world premiere production at the center and we were in the pit and it was very evident that we we're seeing really a dangerous threat to the health of our musicians. And so we began, as, as Casey articulated, this kind of slow succession of cancellations. I think the thing I would say thematically was from the very beginning, we, have, we had to protect the human beings that make up our organization. We're, we're not a venue, we're a labor organization. So staff, volunteers, and musicians. And I was really proud that the board and the staff came to agreement that we would pay the musicians, uh, you know, as best we could throughout the whole period. And we did. Um, so, you know, with a PPP loan, but also some of our reserves, we, we paid the musicians through the summer. And then we began a very arduous labor negotiation because our contract was irrelevant at that point. We couldn't fulfill any of the promises we were making for production. So it took months to figure out, well, what does media mean to musicians? How do we compensate for all the education programs we would normally do live? How do we put them on uh, platforms? What's the accessibility? Months and months. And what do we do if musicians want to take a leave because they're afraid to come back? It, it, we ended up writing probably the most complicated contract I think we've ever produced. And at the end of the day, we retroactively paid the orchestra because while we were in negotiations, everything was on hiatus. So that was a wonderful thing that happened. But beginning in January of 21, we became basically Netflix. And I've never seen a team pivot so aggressively to get online um, what had happened in the summer prior was with the musicians were doing all these organic videos, you know, from their living rooms, from the streets, from their porches. They were reflecting their, their gratitude that they were being compensated, but couldn't perform. So they, did, they took it upon themselves to do it. But in January, fast forwarding, we systematized all of that video production. And I think a really big theme for us was that we had much more capacity for innovation than we realized, uh, that we could actually pivot much faster because there's a lot of inertia in our industries. And so I was really proud of that. And our school systems, our, our parents, our, our uh, nonprofit partners, they all said how grateful they were for this content to keep people engaged throughout the pandemic. So I think those are some of the themes is kind of the democratization of, of the arts through digital platforms. The, th the third thing I would say is we also innovated by beginning what Casey did on the plaza, we started to do in sort of what I would say the public squares of Orange County. We took, we built a mobile stage, we took it out and we had something called Symphony on the Go. And we did in a matter of a couple months, 30 free concerts. And we never done that many public concerts that quickly. And throughout all of this, I just saw how emotional people were to gather and hear something beautiful together, not in isolation. I think that was really very moving and a great reminder of the, the power of, of, of what we do specifically. So, um, you know, we're all wrung out. Uh, I have to say, I think neurologically, everybody on the staff is, is really, they've gone through this roller coaster and we're fearful a bit, but I think like Casey's team, we're very optimistic of our resilience. So, you know, I, I am really proud of the way we've hung together as, a, as an organization. Yeah.
Thank you. Well, I think we can all remember that time when individual artists were posting their stories on, you know, Instagram and, and uh, shower, shower concerts and everything else that they could innovate from home. So it's wonderful to hear that it's been democratized and, and we found a way, you found a way to, you know, push that out to the masses. Um, Kristen, for your team and your organization, you know, what has the last year been like and where are you guys now? So uh, I'm, I'm glad John used the word resiliency because that's definitely the word I would use. I don't want to lighten how hard it was in the beginning. I mean, it was just heartbreaking to shut down our theaters and see our organization shut down and see our artists lose contract work. I mean, um, a lot of them count on, on gig contract work at the time to make their bills. Um, so the first thing we did was we launched our own relief fund um, and we were releasing just like uh, relief checks to artists in the area within two months. Um, some people saw our check before they saw unemployment <laughs> checks. Uh, and that's something we were really, really proud of at the time because that was before state funding was kind of coming in and helping people out. Um, and so we were doing that right away. Um, we did a lot of round tables uh, that would allow artists to sort of navigate that world. Like, what does it mean to go virtual? Um, what are we, I mean, at the time we absolutely were thinking, oh, we'll be back in three months and we'll have to think about air ventilation and stuff. And so there's some stuff now on your YouTube that's like, you know, I look at it now and I'm just thinking, oh, we were so cute and naive back then, uh, thinking that we would have all the answers and now we're finally seeing our doors open. But, um, and I hope, uh, I hope you'll bear with me a little bit again. I'm the representative that nurtures theater. So I'm going to use a little bit of our time today to highlight the good work that theaters were doing during the pandemic because they were there. And I think some of us didn't even know it was happening because it was so quick, um, that pivot towards virtual worlds. So um, I know the Wayward Artist in Santa Ana, it's a newer theater company and the Chance Theater in Anaheim that's been around for a long time. Uh, they were streaming full productions that people could access from home. And it was nice to see that accessibility. Um, P3 Theater Company was doing the same thing. And uh, I just saw last week, they're now nominated on broadwayworld.com for some of the good like technology and the streaming that they've been doing. So it's great to see one of our organizations be highlighted in that way. Um, I saw Alchemy Theater Company uh, they're a roving theater company, so we consider them all of Orange County. Um, they started an, a YouTube series called um, RB Heard, uh, which spotlights underrepresented, underrepresented theater artists. Um, and they're still doing that. So they started it during the pandemic, and I saw that they were recently posting some um, not too long ago. Um, similarly, the Wayward Artists started a program called Wayward Voices that offers stipends to artists of color to create um, streamable performances, and that's still happening. Um, so I'm seeing some of these initiatives that our organization started in the pandemic because they needed to, as they wanted to create content and keep going, but they've kept it running. Um, and that's just so lovely to see. Um, and this month, of course, we're seeing um, more theaters open up their doors with holiday related programming. So if you're sitting there, if your audience listening to this, thank you for listening to us talk today. But if you're looking for shows to see, um, Camino Real, Chance Theater, Curtis Theater, Laguna Playhouse, Maverick, P3, South, there are South Coast, Rep, Stages, they're all doing holiday programming. And it's so great to see these companies come back, right? Um, a lot of them were hit really hard. I, again, I don't want to limit how difficult this was for people or, or lessen it. Um, some companies lost their venue um, and we're seeing them trying to find their homes now or rent spaces. And it is really difficult for them. Um, but they've managed to survive um, enough that they're still creating programming. And that just warms my heart. Um, and it's nice to see. Uh, and I'm also really excited because new companies are popping up and I don't know how these people are doing it because I'm like, you're sitting there isolated in your homes and you're like, now's the time to start a theater company. But we have two new members um, and it's Bold Theater in Los Alamitos, an unnamed theater company in Irvine. So I think theater is thriving. Um, and I think in Orange County, we're really going to see a lot coming soon. Well, that's wonderful to hear. I'm so glad. I think one of the things that I've heard from a number of artists of all different mediums is that, you know, in the darkest hours of COVID and, and the pandemic, um, creativity did begin to thrive. Um, and we saw some of that happen. So I would love to, you know, continue our, our more um, optimistic look ahead and ask the three of you, you know, how COVID's obviously been something that we as an entire world collectively experienced. 
Um, do you see those experiences now being reflected in some of the new art and new presentate new um, performances that are coming out? Um, Kristen, maybe I'll start with you for that one. Yeah, of course. So for me, um, definitely I'm seeing technology being embraced. I didn't mention this earlier, but I'm a scenic and projections designer by profession. So in addition to the OC Theater Guild is my volunteer work to the community and I enjoy it greatly, but I'm a projections designer. So I've always loved the technology and now I'm seeing theaters embrace it. I just saw an amazing uh, production of The Nether at the Wayward Artist in Santa Ana. They were using um, video screens and audio. It was a very immersive experience to tell a really moving story about um, uh, technology and the pitfalls of living in virtual space, which I mean, obviously that's a direct connection, which is great that they were doing that. Um, but for me, I think the biggest thing is I'm seeing a lot of audience passion. So um, I, for me, I'm a theater lover. I've been going out. So I saw, I've been the Wayward Artist, Costa Mesa Playhouse, Chance Theater, La Mirada, Maverick. Um, and some audiences are more full than others. There is obviously an audience hesitancy um, going back to the shows, but the people that are there are super passionate. I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing the bigger laughs, the more engaging audiences with the theater. And if, if, and this is true for all the arts. The audience is part of that storytelling. So seeing people engage in a more full experience than I think I saw before the pandemic. I don't think it's in my head. I think it's real. Um, is really exciting to see. And it's out there. So I, I just hope that those audience members that still feel unsafe, um, I, I hope that we will continue to work hard um, and make them feel like they can come back to the to the arts again. That's great to hear. Um, John, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I, I am grateful for the opportunity to have seen the inherent creative capacity of the orchestra musicians as individuals. And I think as we move forward, and particularly in the, like in the context of Symphony on the Go, the musicians were curating their own programs. It wasn't coming particularly from staff or Carl per se. And so they were hosting, they were leading the conversations. And it's not, you know, I shouldn't be surprised. They're all very intelligent, really well-trained. But you know, in the orchestral setting, there is sort of a, a, a shield between the audience and the individual player that is just the nature of ensemble playing. So that was really very rewarding. And I think in some ironic ways, their morale went up because their own creative capacity was being tested during the period. I don't want to say that's true for everybody. Um, you know, there, there certainly are people who miss dramatically the, the collegial nature of symphonic music, the power of it, but that chamber music experience was really, was wonderful. I think we learned so much about digital programming and, you know, one of the things I think we did differently than many orchestras was that the length was of our of our offerings were, were much shorter. So we did a Thursdays at seven series. So every week we were issuing content and it was 20 minutes. And I think we came to realize there's increasing fatigue around the digital landscape. And I do think that's a residue we're gonna have to grapple with, which is just, you know, if there's hesitancy to come back to the hall and there's some hesitancy to participate on digital offerings, you know, the reach of certain people, some segments of our audience will be more difficult and we're going to have to be creative at sort of luring them back. You know, we recently reached out to people who were not coming to the first three programs we offered beginning in early September. So we, we asked them, you know, what are your reasons for not coming? And, and they, these were ticket holders. Um, and of course, it, it falls along a spectrum of, of concern for their safety or simply not wanting to wear a mask for two hours. I think that's not an uncommon issue we're facing. Um, so we're offering them opportunities to come to open rehearsals where A, they're, they're able to space much more easily and they get inside the artistic experience. And, you know, I'm grateful that our musicians and our conductors and so forth are willing to allow for that opportunity to get closer to the art and re be reminded of the power of the live experience, which, you know, as Kristen said, I mean, the emotional response from people has been really very moving. So I think people are not gonna take for granted 
you know, the musicians, the artists won't take for granted the audience. I don't think the audience is taking their experiences for granted. This was a kind of a reminder of just how much we missed. Yeah. Thank you. I think that leads right into my next question was going to be, you know, how do we think this last year's experience will reshape how we all experience the art? And you guys both really touched on that. Casey, before we go to our final questions, do you have anything else you'd like to share? No, I mean, I think I, Kristen and John said a lot of really great things, and I, I tend to agree with all of them. I, I think that there's a shift maybe in technology in terms of education and classwork. As I noted, we, you know, we were able to reach more people, make it, make it an easier experience. But uh, I think what John said was spot on. There's fatigue. Uh, the, you know, when it, we did a lot of surveying during that time, and it became clear to us that people were happy to accept virtual performances kind of as a as a stopgap measure or something for the for this moment. But you know, I was asked a lot if we thought this was going to be a big shift in the industry. And I, I don't think so. I think people wanted to, they want to come back, there is hesitancy that wasn't there in June, I think, and that's by and large, because of the Delta variant, we saw our surveys tell us that confidence in coming back and feeling safe, not specific to anything we were doing, I think people feel we're doing the right things but they don't want to sit in a mask or they are afraid of Delta. But I also, we're starting to see an upswing uh, around holiday performances and I think performances in early uh, 22. So that's, that's positive. And I think people just want to, by and large, return to normal. I don't think they necessarily want to see shows uh, with COVID themes or isolation themes. I think there are plays and theaters and, and, and companies that are going to do that, that are going to reflect. But I think people want to put it behind them and forget about it and, and have joy or have art that focuses on other, uh, other challenges, other aspects of the human condition, and maybe not as much uh, about COVID. I, I think people just, just miss what they had and they want to get back to it as soon as they feel safe. Yeah, thank you. So for our final question, we have just maybe two minutes, I think. Um, you know, we've talked about, obviously, um, the value of the actual performance, but I would love to hear from each of you what your perspectives are in terms of how you've seen people react. And you've touched on this a little bit, but in terms of people's relationship and view of the value of the arts outside of that singular when they're in, their bottom is in the seat and they're seeing it, the larger connection that they might have to the arts as an important aspect of their community and their their day to day life. Um, maybe Kristen, you want to start with that one first? Sure. Yeah, I I I do think that there is an increased value in the storytelling, um, and specifically telling stories that are. Uh, are new um, and innovative. And I think there's a desire for that. There's this other side of the pandemic where we started really looking internally and socially at what's going on in our world. Um, and right now there's a huge uh, desire to see more art that will um, bring that to the forefront. And, and it's an important part of our society because it always has been. Um, but now I see a deeper value and, and not just a, this is part of our world, but a, we want arts to be a part of our world. Um, and I, I feel, I feel very appreciative. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's because we are seeing some companies go away or losing their venue that now we're appreciating their place in our society, um, just as, as humans, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Casey, John, anything else to add? Final final thoughts for the close? Um, I'll jump in. I, I just think that the center coming back uh, was, uh, I, I felt like we were a great source of civic pride. I think when the center reopened and Pacific Symphony coming back, every every bit of activity we had here was a signal to the community that that we were past the pandemic. And I know we're not past the pandemic, but we're certainly not as low and uh, st with stay at home orders in the way that we were. So uh, I just think it's it's signaled to the community that because we were the last ones to come back, that we we were back. And I think a little bit to Kristen's point, I mean, I, I came up through fundraising uh, and always talked about the importance of 
the live experience till I was blue in the face. But I think that people stopped listening to that. And I think this reminded people that this is a different experience than just sitting at home watching Netflix and that it's not just about the art on stage. It's about a, a coming together as a community and seeing people and having a shared experience. And these things that we said for years to excite people about our industry, I think have a new relevance. And, um, and, and that's, that's the, that's the silver lining of all this, I believe. Thank you, John. I think, um, especially with abstract art, like symphonic music, mostly, mostly abstract. I do think, uh, people commented on how it magnified so many emotions for them when they came back and heard the orchestra, things that they hadn't been able to release emotionally were unlocked when they came into the concert hall. I mean, I'm choked up when I think about what it was like to, to return together and hear a, you know, a great orchestral work and look around and just see tears streaming down people's eyes. And I asked, I asked them, I said, what were you feeling? They said, you know, I just had bottled up so many things that got un uncorked for me in the concert. Also, it's hard to describe why that happens. And some people may be skeptical of that, but I can, you know, if you've lived in, in halls and theaters and it, it is, it's such a gift. And I do think that we have a challenge in reminding people that we're not just pure entertainment that they're, you know, the really high quality art has a kind of a magical ability to, to reach inside you in ways that I don't think other forms of engagement can do. And I hope that people take a risk, those who are new to the center or to the theater community, I really hope they take a risk and come and try us out. Um, that's my hope. Um, new audiences, this is a good time to learn and experience us. Wonderful. Well, thank you, John. I think that's a wonderful way to close uh, with a call to action that everyone, you know, if possible, if they're comfortable to, to go back, go, go to a show, go experience art in your community, wherever you are. Um, that's the end of this first session. Um, I hope everyone will return. We have a second session. Again, we'll be talking about the economic value and how, most importantly, we as a community through various dollars and various sources of money can continue to support the great work we just heard about. So thank you all for joining, and I will see you in a little bit. At UCI, we believe in the infinitely curious. We believe in the courageous of thought, the ones willing to fail again and again until one day they don't. When you have the courage to see things differently, to see opportunity where others see impossibility, amazing things will happen. At UCI, we stop at nothing to change the world, to save lives and deliver the extraordinary. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the OC Forum, the future of philanthropy in the arts. My name is Taryn Palumbo. I'm your moderator and I'm the executive director of Orange County Grantmakers and I'm so happy to be here with you today. For this second session, uh, we have a wonderful conversation and panel prepared. Um, I am so pleased to be joined with Richard Stein, president of Arts Orange County. Randy Cohen, Vice President of Research at Americans for the Arts, and Eddie Torres, President and CEO of Grantmakers in the Arts. I'm going to take the time now for each of them to do a brief introduction of themselves and their organizations. Richard, why don't you go first? Thank you so much, Taryn, and uh, thank you for including me in the forum today. Uh, I've attended many of the OC forums in the past, and they're all wonderful. It's a great organization. Uh, I, so I'm president and CEO of Arts Orange County. We are the nonprofit countywide arts council for Orange County. We are designated by the Board of Supervisors as the official local arts agency and state local partner. And uh, we provide a wide range of programs and services to artists, arts organizations, and uh, local government. A good portion of what we do is offered free of charge and then we also have a whole consulting practice where we work primarily with local government uh, on a variety of projects. Thank you, Richard. It's great to have you with us. And Randy. 
Hi, good afternoon. It's great to be with you. Coming in today from Washington, D.C., uh, though I'm a California boy, so grew up in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, back when it was fruit orchard, so it's uh, it's great to be back home. Um, so uh, I'm Vice President of Research with Americans for the Arts. Uh, we've been around since 1960, and uh, what we do is support the national network of 4,500 local arts agencies, organizations like Rick's. Uh, we do that through advocacy, professional development, uh, networks, and then I do the research and so that's that's providing the you know information tools people need to make uh, for the arts and uh, you know how the arts strengthen our communities socially educationally economically and so I look forward to talking more about that thank you so much Randy and Eddie Hi, I'm Eddie Torres. I'm Grantmakers in the Arts President and CEO. Grantmakers in the Arts is uh, basically an industry association of folks who support the arts philanthropically and using public funds. Uh, we're about half of our members are foundations, whereas uh, the other half are a mix of uh, nonprofits and public agencies. We have about 400 plus members nationwide and going into Canada and uh, parts of Europe. Um, basically what we do is we provide professional development for uh, organizations and institutions that support the arts so that they can do so more responsively, more equitably, more sustainably. Uh, we do this through professional development, through workshops, webinars, uh, etc. And uh, we also facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning so that people are able to teach one another how to uh, support the arts. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all three of you for joining. So this, this second half of our conversation is very much focused on, you know, the future of supporting the arts, both financially and from um, a community support perspective. So I'd like to start with you, Richard. Obviously, during COVID, your organization was instrumental in bringing in so many dollars to our local community. We're so grateful for uh, your work. But I'm wondering, what was the education of both the community and our elected officials like when you were coming to them to say, look, the arts are invaluable and need to be supported? What was that conversation like? And what do you think that really means in terms of future funding as we look ahead to a life hopefully outside of COVID and, uh, and as we continue to evolve? Uh, well, Taryn and uh, uh, company, uh, Arts Orange County has as a major portion of its mission uh, advocacy and maintains strong relationships with elected officials on an ongoing basis, particularly on the federal and state level. Um, and as a result, uh, connecting with those elected officials uh, about the current circumstances of the arts was not that difficult for us to accomplish. Uh, we did come in armed with significant data that we gathered. Uh, our last major event ourselves, a Creative Edge lecture, took place just two weeks prior to the shutdown. And um, by May, we had conducted a, a survey of the arts community in terms of the COVID impact and what their anticipated losses would be. And um, we were able to share that with elected officials. <clears throat> But it was most important that we had that uh, data to share with the Orange County Board of Supervisors, because historically, the unique character of Orange County is such as you know that we do not revolve around a major city. And so Orange County has not been, been historically a big funder of the arts at all. Uh, and almost all of the support has come from private philanthropy. There's a couple of cities that do give, uh, but we approached the Board of Supervisors uh, both individually in meetings as well as appearing at a uh, regular meeting of theirs to present our uh, results of the survey and um, found them to be quite receptive with respect to the CARES Act funds that they had at their disposal. Uh, all agreed uh, to allow nonprofits, not just arts organizations, but nonprofits at our urging to be eligible to apply for the business relief funds that they had at their disposal. Um, one district, however, set up a special arts relief fund as well, District 3 under Supervisor Wagner. With that groundwork, when the American Rescue Plan Act funds became available a year later, uh, we were 
uh, far more successful earlier on in persuading the Board of Supervisors overall to make $5 million available of their ARPA money uh, divided equally among the five districts, which complicates things. I won't go into that, but as you know, the, the fact is that uh, we're a very fragmented community in many ways and not much happens on a countywide level. Uh, but uh, it was very gratifying to uh, achieve that. But on a higher level, certainly the work that we did uh, in terms of our advocacy work uh, helped lead uh, to the uh, uh, Shuttered Venue uh, uh, Relief Act and uh, our institutions here overall between the county money, the CARES Act money, uh, the ARPA money, the, the Shuttered Venue operator grants, uh, has received more than $85 million in government support. And, you know, I look upon it as being sort of like, um, you know, when a hurricane hits or an earthquake hits, that uh, even those people who in the past might have been reluctant to go to the government for support uh, are in a position where they realize that they need a handout and uh, they, they approach FEMA. So the, these were sort of the uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management <laughs> Administration tools that we connected our arts community to and uh, had advocated vigorously for uh, both on our own and in partnership with Americans for the Arts and Californians for the Arts and many other uh, organizations in our community that engage in this kind of advocacy work. That's wonderful. So looking ahead, um, do you feel like there's been a awakening maybe, as you can call it, in terms of the perception of why we, it's so important to continue to support the arts for future funding opportunities or just how those arts programs are kind of embedded in the core of our community? Well, just like with a private philanthropist, we said thank you a lot, and one of the ways we did that was to honor the County Board of Supervisors at our recent Orange County Arts Awards event, uh, to thank them for their support. And two of the supervisors showed up and uh, to, in person to receive the award and um, uh, spoke to the importance of the arts in the community and that Orange County is an arts county to quote one of them. So uh, we feel that we made significant headway in uh, developing a relationship with current elected uh, officials at the county level, and we'll continue the conversation moving forward uh, to explore ways that they can continue to support the arts community. That's great. So um, let's now move to Randy. Randy, um, what, um, your organization obviously is a national organization. So, you know, how has your community rallied? Um, what are some of the programs you're seeing nationally or some of the trends you're seeing as these organizations are now looking ahead, looking to outside to when COVID is over to kind of continuing this connection with um, programs and opportunities that really um, tie, you know, um, community-based programs and arts programs to um, regular activities and to regular opportunities that might not be traditional arts programs if they're not even available right now. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, well, you heard actually from uh, Rick the incredible work that they do, and, and I, I got to say, um, you know, he's, he's a, a great national example. Uh, and I'll even say the work he's done locally has been um, fantastic, but he's also, Ricky, been a great leader nationally. Other communities, other counties, arts councils across the country have really looked to you and the work you do uh, to make those advancements in their communities as well. So um, that, that's that's tremendous leadership, and uh, but Orange, uh, the, co the community there is lucky to uh, have you. Um, we did several uh, big national studies of arts organizations and artists uh, have 
we're looking at the impact of the uh, pandemic on the arts. And, um, you know, it was devastating. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, what you've seen nationally is, is what's been, uh, or locally has been what's been reflected nationally. The arts have been first to close and last to open. Um, 99% of organizations that do in-person events had to have cancellations. Artists unemployment, over 60%. Uh, we saw artists of color um, experience even higher rates of unemployment, even larger percentage uh, of income losses. And so, um, and you know, the, the, um, we continue to recover along with the uh, of the economy, but um, the arts the arts are lagging the national economy in terms of recovery. So there's still some challenges there. But um, looking ahead, and you know, how do we get through here? You know, local arts agencies like Rick's play a central role in increasing public access to the arts, supporting artists and arts organizations, enhancing quality of life. Um, and they do this by aligning arts programs with community needs. And, uh, you know, two of the big community needs these days are um, how do we heal and jumpstart the economy, uh, all aspects of the economy. Some are, are recovering well, some are really lagging. And then also, how do we unify our communities and really reconnect people? And, um, you know, so we see arts, local arts agencies, um, Leveraging CARES Act dollars uh, through the state and local government uh, to fund the arts. Uh, a lot of communities are doing artist relief funds uh, to provide um, funding and investment in artists to keep them in the communities and uh, recovery grants for um, cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Uh, you know, just just to be open it has all kinds of new expenses now, and um, they've converted um, uh, project grants to just general operating support grants, you know? Um, so communities are finding a way uh, to keep uh, to keep invested um, and keep their arts organizations going. And what that does is that provides us some of these community benefits like the economy. And that's not a way we really think about the arts, right? We, we love what they do for our quality of life and, and quality of the community. But the fact is arts are a bigger industry than most people realize. Nationally, it's a $920 billion industry, supports 5.2 million jobs. That's 4.3% of the gross domestic product. It's a bigger share of the economy than agriculture, transportation, construction. And right there in California, it's a $233 billion industry, 7.4% of gross state product, 780,000 jobs. And those are data from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. So those aren't special interest generated. That comes from the feds. There's also really powerful research now that shows um, at the state level, when you increase arts jobs, the rest of the economy follows. So it's not like, well, you know, as the economy goes, so go the arts jobs. Um, again, federally sponsored research using the BEA data that shows if you stimulate the arts, it's going to grow other segments of the economy. So, you know, how does that work? Well, one way it works, you know, in a study that we do uh, every five years is looking at the economic impact of spending by nonprofit arts organizations and their audiences. And it's a big national study and we've got communities of all sizes and in every state. Um, but what I'll say is this, we did 212,000 audience surveys in the last study, a ridiculous oversample, right? But we wanted to ask people, you know, how much did you spend related to this arts event that you're attending? You know, so think of the last time you went to an arts event, you know, did you just like run in, see the show and run home? No, you know, you maybe you, you drove there and paid for parking and had dinner and saw the show then and then maybe a dessert or drinks afterwards. And, you know, we've got little ones, uh, some of this, you know, on the call here. Um, double the cost evening on babysitting, right? So there's all this economic activity related to attending that arts event. The typical attendee spends $31.47 per person per event not including the cost of admission. So that's driving commerce to local businesses. And the other thing the arts do that's that's so important is, you know, it gets people out of our homes and into the public spaces for shared experiences. You know, we're, we're all gonna go see Hamilton for the third time or something. 
Nobody cares where you practice your faith or uh, who you voted for. These are these are shared experiences, things we do together, festivals, arts events, exhibitions. 72% of the American population says the arts unify communities, regardless of age, race, or ethnicity. 73% say the arts help me understand other cultures in my community. And those are findings that cut across all socioeconomic strata. And so I, the good news story here is that, you know, the arts aren't a frill. They're not an extra, but rather they're an investment in the community that provide cultural uh, benefits, but also economic and well-being benefits for people across the community. That's so that's so wonderful to hear, because I think so often we see we think of the arts as just that extra, as you said, like, oh, it's just it's it's not a necessary, but it's a nice to have. And I would love, you know, the audience today to, to go home or well, we're watching this live from a streaming session, so maybe you are home, but to to end this session thinking about um, really how the arts is embedded and touches all of our lives in so many different ways. And I think that that economic touch is so important and the cultural touch. I mean, I just know that, um, you know, I haven't been to a show yet and I am so excited to go to one and it is it's so much more than just the show. It's uh, it's it's a community event. It's I'm I can't wait to sit in a room with you know 500 other people and experience something uh, with everyone else at the same time. Um, we'll have some time for more questions. Yes, exactly. Um, but I want to make sure we get to Eddie as well. So Eddie, you know, I think we've heard a little bit from um, Rick and Randy this this public private partnership, the investment of philanthropy. So how have funders, the funders in your community, how have you seen them evolve in their thinking about supporting the arts, uh, maybe from pre-pandemic to now? And as Randy shared, how are they also thinking about perhaps making the connection between invest, investments and philanthropic dollars that are going to other issues and other areas of need with the dollars that are going to arts and arts support? Well, I think that there's a, three big patterns that we're seeing in terms of arts support right now over the course of the pandemic, and they're all encouraging. You know, the first is um, increased support for artists. And I think that, that a central reason for that has been that the plight of the worker has become so sort of demonstrable now. You know, particularly as we've been thinking of gig workers and recognizing how vulnerable workers are, we've also come to realize, oh, artists are the original gig workers and artists are as vulnerable as anybody. First of all, they're vulnerable economically because they're, they're so much of what they do relies on people coming together as Randy so perfectly articulated, uh, but also so much of what they've been doing historically to complement their art making has actually centered around parts of the economy that have been contracting. So when they're not making art, they're waiting tables or they're bussing dishes or they're uh, tending bar. And these are all parts of the economy that have been hit really hard by the uh, um, pandemic. So what we're seeing philanthropically is increased support for individual artists, which is the way it's supposed to be. We're actually really glad and we want to see that continue. The other piece that we've been seeing has been uh, capitalization. So basically we're seeing uh, a field that is recognizing that you just have to be a lot more flexible with organizations uh, right now. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing funders who are basically relaxing uh, the requirements for the use of a grant. Um, that is really, really important. Particularly, it's important now that we do it, but also that we keep it going into the future. But specifically because we're looking at a crisis moment now, and we want to get out of this crisis stronger, right? If you look at the statistics around the Great Recession, we recovered from the Great Recession, but the arts organizations were actually le less robust after the Great Recession, even after philanthropy recovered. And the reason was that the giving field went back to very, very restricted funding, which was not at all what the field needed. So they were just less 
resilient when uh, uh, the next crisis hit. So flexibility is key. The flexibility we're seeing now, fantastic. We just want to keep it going. Uh, we also want to see um, the continued uh, support, increased support for multi-year grants and for general operating support, both of which have increased and we think is fantastic and we want to keep that going, right? That's going to be essential to keeping this field healthy. And then finally, the last thing that we're seeing is an increased support for equity. We're recognizing the way that these uh, communities, specifically low-income communities, remote communities, and communities of color were hit by this pandemic and recognizing that their artists and their organizations are a key part of that. Everything, again, everything that you just articulated, Brandy, in terms of the positive impacts of entering a community to have a robust arts experience, it really matters the kind of community that you're investing in and recognizing that there are plenty of communities that just haven't been invested in historically. And so this is a great moment to recognize that an investment in the arts is an investment in communities and communities that haven't been invested in a long time really need that investment now more than ever. So we're seeing great patterns. We just want to keep them going. That's so wonderful to hear. Um, you know, I think we talk about, uh, at OCG, we talk about this idea of, um, you know, making sure that we are responding to the needs of the nonprofit and recognizing what those challenges are, what kind of funding dollars are needed and being responsive to that. And I think it's it's makes so much sense that in the arts, um, you know, right now funding is needed not just for uh, a specific program, but for everything. As you shared, Randy, it's it's cleaning. It's, you know, making sure that things are sanitary so that people, so that organizations and theaters can stay open. So let's look ahead and let's, let's, you know, what are we excited about? What's, what's hopeful? I know, um, you know, Broadway is back, right? That was the, that was the news a couple, maybe a month or two ago. Broadway is back. We've seen the resurgence of live performing arts and live theater. Um, uh, I think there is a sense that um, we are, you know, entering the new phase of how we can all experience art together, even if things have changed from maybe the, where they were pre-COVID. So for each of you, um, you know, what are you most excited about? What are you hopeful about? Or what do you think the future of arts looks like, whether it be performing arts or um um, you know, experiential arts or, or whatever it may be, what do you see as some of those future opportunities? I'll go with you first, Richard. Well, I have said almost from the start of the pandemic that I think that coming out at the end will be a renaissance of the arts, uh, of, of the likes that was seen, you know, after the dark ages and uh, a renaissance of the arts in, in Europe at that time both in terms of innovation and creativity, because we've seen our artists and arts institutions um, engage in uh, lots of new and different kinds of programming during this period. And I think uh, the other side of that coin is really that audiences have been uh, treated to uh, unusual artistic experiences. Uh, things that are new and different uh, that uh, they did not normally see from the same producers and presenters that they have come to rely on. And so I'm hopeful that that will stick and that people's broadened horizons uh, will uh, be manifest in uh, uh, strong audiences for new and uh, innovative work and that the producers and presenters will continue to provide that moving forward. And as I said earlier, I really think that uh, um, we hope that our message to our local board of supervisors will help ensure that uh, public funding will become an important component of the funding mixture here in Orange County, uh, because 100,000 people are employed in the creative industries and our local government receives approximately $1 billion in tax revenue from the creative sector. So the funds are there to invest back into its growth and development. Thank you, Richard. That makes sense. And Randy? Yeah, um, 
you know, the challenge is ongoing that, you know, the uh, the arts are lagging uh, the overall economic recovery. Um, you know, nonprofit arts organizations still have a job loss of three times greater than all nonprofit organizations, but, you know, uh, working their way back. And, um, you know, the good news is, though, is that people are attending. And um, through the great work of our arts councils and public and private sector investment, um, you know, we're seeing demand uh, for the arts uh, increase. Uh, as of October, 52% of uh, attendees to in-person arts events, and these are some big national surveys, tens and tens of thousands of people surveyed, 52% are already Already returning uh, and back uh, seeing the arts. And that's up from 38% the month before and 17% way back in April, right? So you can really see some growth. And I think that's inspirational. And 19% um, additionally are saying, I'll be back, but by the end of the year. So uh, I'm very optimistic um, that people have been touched by the arts. Um, and you know, the pandemic uh, was really hard on, on mental health, people's mental health, you know, and um, the federal government tracks it. On any given day, you know, 11% uh, of the population says, you know, I've got depression, anxiety, or the like, and that's over three times the rate now. Yet, um, the research has shown, and there's been a lot of research, that when people who've engaged in the arts during this pandemic actually have reported decreased depression, decreased uh, anxiety, increased life satisfaction. You know, really powerful. You know, the arts have touched us. The arts have helped us persist through this pandemic and, and into the future. And so I'm I'm very optimistic. And, and I think the arts are absolutely on the right side of what needs to be done in this country. I agree, Randy. I think, uh, you know, I, I missed the Nutcracker last year. It's uh, it's an annual tradition for me, and uh, I, I'm gonna take my son to a mini one this year, and I'm so excited. You know, I think that's that's just it's just part of a tradition. It's part of my family experience at the holidays, and so I fully fully agree with you, uh, Eddie. How about you? Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm in part gonna echo both Rick and Randy's remarks. Um, the extent to which the public has embraced the arts, I think, has been really beautiful. I mean, when you look at organizations that have actually been able to weather this pandemic, um, among the ones who've been best able to weather it have been the ones who've been able to bring their programming online, first of all. And then second of all, those are oftentimes the education organizations, right? And so you, it, the reason that's working is because people so value those arts experiences and so value those educational experiences for themselves and for their loved ones that they were willing to go outside of their normal patterns to continue to access them. And that means they made an effort. That means they said, this is important no matter what else is going on around me. You know, I think similarly, we've been recognizing the, the importance of artists in ways that we haven't. I think before we've uh, it recognized the importance of art more than we've recognized the importance of artists. And I think that's really, really important, particularly when you're advocating for a field and you need to make that field feel human and recognize that it, it's about people interacting with other people. Um, and then finally, I think that, that very much again to Rick and Randy's points, we're recognizing uh, through public policy responses uh, the, important of the, art, the importance of the arts and artists and recognizing that we need to integrate them into the, the forms of support that we provide to our communities and to our individuals. So I think, again, Rick, I think you put that perfectly. I think we are entering a renaissance. I think we are really, really well positioned for the arts in the future. Thank you, Eddie. Well, I think you put it perfectly for a close to our program. Why is philanthropy and the arts so important? What is the future of? It's about people. It's about our community. So thank you. Um, any last questions or comments for the audience before we close today? Okay, well, 
I want to thank Richard, Randy, and Eddie for joining us in our conversation. Um, I hope our viewers at home enjoyed the conversation. I hope you find an art experience to attend yourself. Go out into your community, whether it be local or a national event or program, um, and, and enjoy it and experience it yourself. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you again to our sponsors, UCI and UCI Health, for making this program possible at no cost to our viewers to get it today. And for more information, be sure to go to the OC Forum website. Um, uh, it's in the description below. Thank you all for joining and we hope to see you again soon. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>